And uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, try to avoid pointing out in every case where they departed from reality and just, you know, try to uh, just tell it like it happened. Um, someday we may get a remake of the movie and uh, tell it more like it uh, uh, actually happened. But uh, uh, this was a very life-changing experience. It, uh, after all these years, 30-some years, it's still something that, you know, just, just basically took over my life and, and nothing uh, was the same after that. Um, there were seven of us. In the movie, there's only six, but uh, there were seven of us working in the woods and uh, we uh, had uh, finished a long day in the woods. We were putting in some long days because cold weather was coming. We were going to try to finish up the contract in time. Let's see, how do you do this, dude? Oh. Left and right. Yeah, hit the bottom button again to turn it back on and right all the Yeah, Arizona. A lot of people don't realize just how much forest there is there. It's uh, actually the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. And uh, it stretches all the way um, from uh, actually the north rim of the Grand Canyon is heavily forested and uh, down across clear into New Mexico. So, uh, uh, we were doing fuel reduction uh, work that, that day. Uh, that's, you know, part of the contract was just thinning the trees, you know, uh, getting rid of the diseased trees and, and spacing them out where they were growing too close together. In Arizona, we have a much lower rainfall, so, you know, it, it really helps speed up uh, the growth to uh, eliminate um, diseased and damaged trees. The logging that had been done the previous year had, you know, naturally damaged some things. So, um, uh, but the, the forest is sectioned off into these strips where you take all of the material that's uh, on the ground, dead trees, whatever, you cut it up and you pile it. And then they come along you know, when the snows are heavy and burn it. Uh, it's not going to get away and cause a forest fire, but it reduces the fuel in these strips that make it easy to stop a forest fire uh, at these lines when it happens. So, well, that's what we were doing that day. And uh, uh, the whole crew lived in Snowflake. And then we drive on the west uh, to uh, Heber and then back on dirt road, clear back up 15 miles up to uh, the top of the rim. Uh, 7,000 some feet, and uh, that's where the contract was. The rim also borders the uh, Apache Indian Reservation. Um, it's a pretty remote area. There were wild horses uh, uh, in the area at that time. As a matter of fact, they're still there. Uh, and uh, Mike was the crew boss here in the upper left. Uh, Ken Peterson, uh, he was played by Peter Berg in the movie, uh, is the next. Alan Dallas, the black sheep of the crew. Uh, uh, Dwayne Smith in the lower left there. He's probably the one that was left out since he was six foot seven and, you know, just a little bit uh, unusual. Uh, sort of stood out. John Gallette. And the youngest on the crew was Steve Pierce, uh, who was played uh, by Henry Thomas in the movie, who was also the little boy in the movie E.T. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognized him, but uh, the, uh, and that's me back then. We all, uh, you know, could fit in a double cab truck, so that's what we were done. We'd uh, finished uh, work that day and loaded up our uh, uh, equipment right in the back of the truck. And, and, you know, in the movie, it gives the impression that, you know, we've been driving for some time and everybody was kind of getting drowsy and everything, but the truth was that uh, we hadn't gone too far. We, in other words, you know, we'd very recently been doing vigorous physical exercise, so we were all wide awake and uh, very uh, clear-headed. Um, we... Uh, we're bumping along this really rough track, uh, and uh, everybody was kind of you know, divided up into little conversations going on in the truck. And uh, 
Um, so I'm not really sure who saw it first, or because it wasn't so alarming at first, that it would be something that you would exclaim about. It was just some glimmers of light coming through the trees, and I thought, you know, because you know this is the forest, and I'm thinking, well, this is definitely something unusual there, you know. But it was deer hunting season, and uh, we'd even heard some shots during the day uh, that day. And so uh, I at first thought it was a hunter's camp there. But see, we were driving south up the hill, up this ridge towards the rim road. And uh, the crest of the ridge was to our right, which uh, was higher than the little dirt track that we were on. And, uh, but, the, but the light was coming from higher than where uh, the ground level would be. So um, I, you know, mentally rejected the idea that it was a hunter's camp there and I started thinking about what else could it be from up high, you know. Now, uh, the Mogollon Rim area there has the highest number of lightning strikes of any area in the entire continental United States outside of the Everglades. So it's, it's got a very high rate, and we've even been driving to work and seen a tree that was on fire because it had just been hit the night before from a, a, a thunderstorm. So that was something that crossed my mind, but I rejected that possibility right away because it had been clear, dry weather uh, and quite cold. Uh, so I was thinking about the possibility of a plane crash hanging up in the tree and uh, learned later that uh, one or two of the other guys was thinking along the same lines. But I could see up ahead where there was kind of a break in the trees and uh, where the, the glow from this thing was kind of shining across the road. So I said, well, hurry up, I get up there so we can see what it is. Because by then people were pointing and saying, what is that? You know, like in the movie, you know. Uh, so uh, when, we, when we got up there, uh, to where this, you know, clearing was, where there was a break in the trees, we could see the source of the light, boom, there it was, you know. It was just unmistakable. It was not, you know, like our, our skeptic there that was claiming that uh, the crew had actually seen the planet Jupiter, you know. This was, this was less than 100 feet away. We could have hit it with a rock, uh, which probably wouldn't have been a good idea, but... <laughs> uh, Alan in the back yelled out, it's a flying saucer, because there was no doubt about what we were seeing. John Gallette uh, said, you know, to him, it was just so, so perfect looking. It was like some million dollar sports car that, uh, you know, just the power and, and the, and the uh, smoothness of it, and the, the whole look of it was just so uh, awe-inspiring. And uh, as soon as uh, Mike stopped the truck, I threw open the door and started towards it. And uh, this, you know, was pretty alarming to the other guys in the crew. And, uh, you know, uh, Alan Dallas said in an interview with uh, Hard Copy, uh, or Inside Edition, uh, back in the 90s, that it looked to him like I was being drawn towards it, like I was in some kind of a trance. And even Steve Pierce, you know, he's recently, he's the young guy on the crew, he, he's also been uh, saying lately, he's been, you know, coming out and doing a few talks with me now and then. And uh, he says it looked to him like I was in some kind of trance, but to me the only trance was, you know, I was entranced by the, the magnificence of this, uh, it was smooth as glass, and it, it, the, the sound it was making just had this power to it. It was a strange sort of a sound, mixed tones, really high off the range of human hearing, and really low to the point where you felt it more than heard it. And uh, uh, some of the guys said they could like feel it in the truck, uh, you know, vibrating everything. And it was, it was just so, uh, you know, that, that's what had me so entranced. To me, it felt like I was under my own volition. I was just, you know, making the choice to see this up close. And the fact that it was really alarming the rest of the crew, yeah, I guess that kind of egged me on that, you know, uh, a little bit of show off there. But uh, 
a lot of it was just curiosity to just see this thing up close. I was thinking it would be gone before I got that close. The closer I got, it wasn't going anywhere, and uh, I really started to have second thoughts. And the closer I got, the more anxious the yells from the from the rest of the crew were getting. And uh, um, some of the guys in the truck said that it it seemed like something was about to happen, and. Uh, of course, that's why they were getting so anxious. Uh, you know, the fact that I was getting close may have uh, uh, contributed to that feeling. But, but I'm thinking now that they were probably sensing the sort of feeling that I was feeling, getting closer to it. You know, that kind of a hair on the back of your neck sort of a feeling. I'm thinking that there was some kind of a charge building up in this. Because when I got up to it, and I was standing there looking up at it, just, you know, awestruck, uh, there was, it, it suddenly got louder, and it started to move in a kind of a uneven sort of way. It started to rise up. And so I, I dove uh, down behind a log there, and uh, they were screaming at me, get out of there, and they were swearing, and, and you know, I really didn't need to be told. I, I was already thinking I was in serious danger, so I decided to run back to the truck. When I stood up, that's when my head and chest were nearest to where it was. And so when this bolt of energy shot out of there, I'm thinking that probably what happened was that there was, that this energy is just kind of like with some sort of a static discharge. An accident, not something that they fired at me, but just something that, uh, you know, they would have avoided if had I not uh, gotten so close so suddenly. And uh, when it hit me, it threw me through the air with such violence. You know, it's really strange. As much as Hollywood changes things in the movie, um, this uh, sequence in the movie is probably the most watered down that, that you can imagine because it was so much more violent than that. It was like I had stepped on a landmine and it threw me through the air. They said my body was so limp in the way I just, you know, hit the ground without protecting myself that they immediately thought it killed me. Almost everybody uh, in, the, in the truck, they started yelling, it got him, it killed him, he's dead, he's dead. And uh, uh, they took off. They were just in a total panic. Now, they got a lot of uh, criticism about that. Uh, people saying, ah, what a bunch of heroes those guys are. You know, I do not agree with that feeling at all. Uh, I think they've been unfairly uh, criticized in that regard. My own family, in the immediate aftermath, uh, sort of uh, directed that feeling. But, um, Mike was responsible for the lives of the rest of the crew. And uh, they had no weapons. And uh, it wouldn't have been wise to risk their lives to save somebody that they thought was already dead. So, you know, Mike getting the crew to safety, everybody yelling, get us out of here, get this bitch moving, you know. So he drove the truck like, like mad, just like in the movie where he's running into trees and, and just really tearing it up, trying to get away and broke the mirror. And, uh, but they got a, a little better uh, grip on themselves once they got away down there. And they spotted some deer hunters on the rim road and uh, tried to go catch them. Um, Alan had the idea that maybe they would have some guns. And, and you know, they were already realizing at that point that they were going to have to return to see if they could uh, rescue me. So they, got, they deserve credit for that. And in the movie, when Mike pulled over and said, look, you know, we need to go back, not everybody in the crew felt real strongly that way. And a lot of them were saying, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's just go get some help. Uh, when Mike said, anybody who doesn't want to go can wait here for us and, and, and we'll go back. Uh, in the movie, everybody gets out and only Mike has the courage to go back. That's not what happened. Nobody volunteered to get out and stand alone in the dark while Mike went back by himself. 
So, you know, totally understandable that even the ones that really were against it going back uh, stayed in the truck. Well, when they, when they approached the area, they could see that uh, the craft was no longer there. Actually, they said they saw it take off. So they felt a lot safer about it, but they were still very, very frightened. And, you know, again, I give them credit for having the courage to go back to see if they could rescue me. Well, um, you know, uh, at, at one point, you know, uh, the crew tells me that Mike fell to his knees and started crying. You know, I left my best friend, what have I done? You know, he felt very badly about having, uh, you know, taken off. Uh, but uh, they, they, they were basically, they said, trying to make this search of the area, calling for me, and they were all huddled around the one flashlight they had, and, and uh, as Steve said, he was making sure he was in the middle of the group the whole time, but, you know, here these, all these tough guys are, are uh, in a very terrified situation. Uh, when they moved through the trees, uh, the moon would suddenly come into view, and they would think the craft was, had come back, and so they were pretty jumpy. So, um, with some relief, I guess, uh, they, would, uh, they all got back in the truck and headed back to town to report it to the sheriff. Um, they argued on the way, Alan Dallas, you know, having been in trouble with the law in the past, he didn't want anything to do with the lawman. He said, well, let's just get some friends with some guns and we'll come back and then if we can't find Travis, then we'll, um, we'll uh, uh, go to the sheriff about it. But, you know, Ken and Mike and uh, the others realize that, uh, you know, what, what if what if we never do find Travis? We don't go and report this right away. That's not going to look good for us. So they went directly in and reported it to uh, the local uh, sheriff's deputy. He called the uh, sheriff and his other men came down from the county seat. And uh, they met with the men at a, a service station there that was uh, close to the night. And the lawmen could tell right off the bat that something really serious had happened. Uh, some of the men were still crying. Steve Pierce was still crying. And uh, uh, they were very shaken up. That was obvious. You know, this was not a prank. Uh, the sheriff was asked about, did the men look like they had been drinking or anything like that? He says, no, I was looking and I didn't see any sign of that. But the men didn't know it at the time, uh, but the sheriff was thinking that probably somebody had killed me, and that this was uh, a cover story and desperately you know, concocted to cover up for why no one was going to see me again. So uh, from the get-go, the men were under a lot of pressure about this murder suspicion. Now in the movie, they didn't go out and search that night, but in real life, uh, the, the sheriff took half the crew out there and made another search. Uh, they were able to find the spot because just like when the crew went back, you know, when they had taken off after seeing me get hit, the truck had spun out and dug grooves in the road, you know. So it was real easy to find my footprints leading up to the clearing. Uh, so they knew they had the right spot. And, you know, naturally they would be looking in the forest and when they come back, you know, was it here or there? But they very quickly found where it was. So that was kind of played up in the movie. But, the next day was when the, when the real search was uh, instituted. The sheriff uh, brought his, you know, all of his men out there. And they had the, uh, the, the posse, which is kind of an auxiliary group uh, that uh, helps the uh, uh, sheriff's department in, in major uh, uh, emergencies. Then they had the uh, Silver Creek Search and Rescue Team. They had Forest Service volunteers, civilian volunteers. They had uh, men on horseback, and uh, uh, the sheriff organized the search to where the people were spaced within sight of the next one across a huge span, and they would move down and sweep the entire area, crisscrossing it in this grid pattern to where nothing could be missed. And uh, the, uh, the horses were behaving very strangely, and, and uh, in the newspaper it told of a horse that just bolted and couldn't be found. And, and when they brought the tracking dogs in, they were unable to find any trail beyond, you know, leading up to the, to the middle of the clearing where I'd fallen, and uh, that was it. So 
Um, the, the area was crisscrossed with uh, aircraft and helicopters and uh, 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 it was an extremely intense search. But during all this searching, the sheriff had a man go with each of the crewmen and who just kept pushing at him. Come on, tell us where you hit the body. Maybe you didn't do it. Come on, tell us who did it. Because, you know, if you cover up for them, you're just as guilty as they are. We don't have to have a body to convict you of murder. So, you know, if you cover up for, uh, for whoever killed Travis, uh, you know, you can hang with, or with whoever did it. So each of the men were being pushed this way. And there was this big confrontation back at the clearing where one of the Forest Service volunteers walked up to Dwayne Smith and grabbed him by the shirt front and jerked him up and said, where'd you hide the body? And uh, it was there, you know, my brother intervened and said, knock it off. And, and, uh, and the guy very wisely uh, dropped that. But, you know, there they said, look, we'll take any test you want to give us. Give us sodium pentothal, give us lie detector test, whatever. Well, the sheriff heard about that and he called in the top uh, law enforcement polygraph examiner in the state, who, who was uh, uh, Cy Gilson. Uh, he did the work for the state police and you know the, through the prison system, the whole thing, you know, and he was uh, the best there was in in the state at that time, and probably still is. Uh, and uh, he, he tested the man. And uh, Steve tells the story about how he was so certain that they had rigged this test. Alan Dallas's mom had kind of been talking to the crew about this and telling them, you know, they 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 probably gonna try to hang you for murder. They want to they want to cover this thing up. So uh, you know, Steve was uh, thinking that you know he didn't want to be any part of <laughs> the situation because he figured that they're gonna find a body out there. And even though he, he and Steve I figured that I was killed by the UFO, that, that they were going to hang for it. And so when they came to get him for the polygraph test, he was sneaking out the back door and the sheriff's people met him out the back door and took him around and put him in the car. And they took him down to the, where they were holding the lie detector test, which was at the courthouse and also where the jail was. So, you know, Steve figured, uh, you know, we're doomed because he figured it was rigged and they were going to hang him for it and, and they'd go straight from the test to the jail. But anyway, he was chosen to go first and uh, everybody passed. At the time, they announced that there was one inconclusive. But see, the way a polygraph test is supposed to be done is they give uh, three or four uh, identical question lists uh, repeatedly to the same person so that any reaction that they find there needs to be occurring at the same question uh, on all three or four times. And that way they can eliminate some kind of a random reaction that might occur if the mind wanders or something, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a quality control that's necessary. Now, Alan uh, went through the question list twice and then got in an argument with the examiner, cussed him out and went out and slammed the door. So they gave him an inconclusive for that. But about the time that uh, Paramount was uh, researching the movie, um, we got a copy of the police file, and then there was a report from one of the deputies who said that, uh, quote, Alan had basically told the truth. So they didn't want to say that at the time because they wanted an out. The, the, the community was very upset about this. They wanted to reassure people that, you know, it, it was a lot easier for the community to accept that maybe these guys had murdered me than to accept that something is scary is the possibility that somebody could be abducted by something, you know, it, that, that frightened a lot of people. So that was the way that went, but, you know, that became a moot point later when Alan was retested by the same examiner as was Mike Rogers, the crew boss. He, uh, this was in 92, or, uh, 90, yeah, it, no, it was early 93. Um, they were uh, retested, as was I. And I was given two tests, and we. Uh, this was with more modern equipment, more years of experience on the part of the examiner, and we all passed at the highest level uh, uh, possible on such tests. But people weren't desperate to explain this away any way they could, so it was a whole lambast bunch of uh, other sorts of accusations that were made. Uh, when I was
was hit, I, all I felt was this, it was like a physical blow, like I'd been hit by a truck I didn't see coming, you know? Uh, and it, it had a sort of a tingling sort of a feel to it, like uh, electricity. The energy was so powerful. Now, Dwayne Smith uh, later um, became an electrician, and, and uh, when I talked to him on the phone, he said it sounded to him like high voltage. And in some of the police files, um, the, the men, uh, one man was being interviewed, and he said that it looked like a long blue flame. And others described it as like a, a wide laser beam sort of a thing. But, but whatever it was, it was extremely, extremely powerful. Steve said it was the brightest thing that he'd ever seen in his life, that it lit up the surrounding forest brighter than daylight. And uh, he said it threw me like 20 feet, and the others say like 10 or 15 feet, but whatever it was, they were convinced that it had killed me. And uh, it's important, to, you know, to identify the situation here as far as what this energy might have been. You know, for anybody to assume that, uh, you know, the, the skeptic there was quoted as saying fire, flame, those are his words, you know. Yeah, the beam itself looked like a, a, a flame or like a bolt of lightning or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to catch my clothes on fire uh, or certainly the surroundings because nobody said it hit the surroundings, they hit me. Uh, well, when I, when I uh, regained consciousness, uh, I was in a lot of pain and I didn't know where I was. I was just totally disoriented. I was not really very uh, fully conscious. I was partially conscious and in and out with, with this pain and this, this feeling that I was suffocating, like I just couldn't get enough air. And uh, uh, there's a scene in the, in the movie where the actor is laying on the table and there's this membrane covering his face and he's struggling to breathe through that and uh, that didn't happen, but I think it does a better job of communicating to the audience the feeling of being unable to get enough air. And if you just showed uh, the actor standing there breathing hard and looking panic, you would just think he was hyperventilating from fear. But the, the, I, the idea that I couldn't get enough air is what really added to this feeling of, of uncontrollable fear that I, that I um, uh, experience. Um, um, I, I came in and out. And I couldn't focus my eyes. There was a light above me. I could tell I was lying on some raised surface like a, a gurney or an operating table. And then I remembered approaching the object and I figured that I'd been hurt and the crew had taken me to the hospital. So I could hear the sounds of movement around me and I thought, well, yeah, you know, the, the, I better hold still because I they had this thing across my chest. Uh, I didn't want to make the situation worse. Uh, you know, the pain uh, was intensified by moving a little bit. You know, so I, I tried to hold still, but I was struggling to sort of clear my mind and clear my vision. I'm looking at this light above me. Uh, even though it wasn't all that bright, it, it hurt to look at it. So I, you know, uh, you know, didn't really keep my eyes open continuously. But then, hearing the sounds of movement around me, I, I looked uh, uh, to, to the side and I saw these uh, creatures standing over me. And that's when I knew I was not in a hospital. And uh, I just flipped out at that point. You know, a lot of people do not understand the complete loss of control that I experienced, the total hysteria and fear. But you gotta understand that uh, you know, the feeling of suffocation, the feeling of pain, to find myself in this cramped space, uh, dimly lit, very hot and humid, and, uh, you know, above all, the, the inability to breathe, and then suddenly seeing these totally strange creatures, you know, to stare into these eyes, it's, it's just indescribable. I rolled away from them, this thing they had on me fell off, and I, and I backed away as they came towards me. And I bumped up against the shelf there, and there was some, um, I just looked to see what was there, and uh, just grabbed the biggest thing there and started swinging it at them. 
before they ever got close enough for me to hit, I was making it clear that if they came closer, uh, that, you know, I was going to defend myself. I was just shaking with weakness. I could hardly stand up, you know. It was, I had staggered back to that point, and I, I just, you know, was, felt that, that the, the feeling that I could hardly move added to that feeling of panic. I don't know if you've ever had a dream where, you know, you're trying to run from something and it, it feels like you're made out of lead or something. That just adds to the fear, like you just need more adrenaline or whatever to get yourself moving. But here they were coming towards me, and then they stopped. And they were all three just staring at me. And uh, it was a very disturbing sort of feeling. Uh, the, their gaze was so penetrating and so intrusive and so... I, I don't know, it, it's just really impossible to describe that the degree of horror that that left me with. And it wasn't just their appearance, and I've, and I've thought more about what that might be. I'm thinking that um, they were trying to reassert control. That somehow that energy hitting me in the head had disrupted my nervous system in a way that made them lose control which is why I regained consciousness in the first place and why they weren't able to control me. And uh, what backs that up is that uh, after I was returned, I, uh, I had an, a brainwave scan and uh, the technician was not informed of who I was or what had happened because it was so, you know, it was so crazy media-wise that uh, it was best for me to go in under a assumed name. So he was just told to look for some sort of uh, brain trauma. And he found uh, an anomalous wave pattern. And that kind of supports this idea. So I'm going to take this uh, EEG report and uh, see what uh, a modern uh, uh, brain uh, neuroscientist would think of that particular uh, odd pattern. And also, it might be interesting to have another one done to see if that odd pattern has persisted. Because, you know, if it was something that prevented them from controlling me, That'd be pretty neat to still have it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's something to, uh, to follow up on with some further research. But, uh, so, uh, I, was, I was prepared to fight my way past them. The only door, uh, I was just thinking escape, escape. And the, other, the only door was on the other side of them. And I was going to fight my way past them. But before that, it came to that, they all uh, together uh, in unison just turned and went out the door. Uh, which was quite a relief to me, but, uh, you know, I was in this totally uh, out of my mind with fear sort of state and just, just shaking where I could hardly stand, but um, they had gone down this little passage to the right, and so I went to the left, and uh, just looking for a way out. I was thinking in the back of my mind, I wasn't really thinking, it was just some general idea, and it you know, probably was erroneous, that, uh, that the craft was still there in the woods and all I had to do was just open a door and jump to the ground. But uh, I pieced together the, the um, area of the ship that I did, in, uh, did see and it's apparent now that uh, had I opened what I thought to be doors that it wouldn't have led to the exterior of the ship. But I did a lot of things that weren't uh, really uh, the result of clear thinking. Uh, I was in such a panic that um, I was kind of torn between the fear of them pursuing me and uh, the fear of what I might uh, encounter because this passageway curved so tightly I couldn't see very far behind me or very far ahead of me. And uh, when I came to this uh, round room, I saw rectangles that I thought might be doors. Uh, but when I moved in there to see if I could, uh, you know, open the door and, and get out, um, the room darkened, and I could see stars. Either they were either visible like through the the ship itself, uh, or some kind of planetarium like projection on the walls. Uh, but it was most visible from near the center of the room where there was this chair, and the chair had some controls on it which I thought might open some of these doors. It didn't turn out to be that way because I, I wasn't able to open any doors. Um, I couldn't see any light through the crack or see any door to, uh, door knob or button to open the door. So I pushed buttons on the, on the arm of the chair and uh, 
Most of them didn't seem to do anything. A few of them made the lines on the, on the screen there uh, shift, but I didn't even think to touch the screen because I, you know, we didn't have that technology back then, so who knows what that would have done. But moving that lever on the left-hand side made the whole star pattern move in unison, which, you know, I was already very dizzy and unsteady on my feet, which really sort of made me almost fall over because, you know, that was my reference for upright. Uh, and uh, so I, I quit doing that and I was thinking of pushing another button when uh, my attention was caught from the door that I had come through. And uh, I looked and uh, there was this human being, what I took to be a human being at the time, standing there. And uh, uh, right away I assumed uh, that this was uh, someone from Earth, some Earth-based agency there to rescue me from my situation. Uh, I went up and, you know, I was totally out of control with fear. I was just screaming and babbling all kinds of questions. Uh, but I wasn't too troubled by the fact that he wasn't replying because of the, the helmet. I thought maybe this helmet was preventing him from hearing me or from, uh, from you know, being able to be heard if he was to speak. So, you know, when he wanted me to go with, me, go with him and he led me out of there, I was only too happy to go. And uh, he took me through this little airlock-like thing um, uh, out uh, into uh, this huge room. Now, I don't know if the craft was there the whole time that I was assuming it was still in the woods or if the, it had been brought into this big hangar-like area in the meantime. I just know that when I came out of there, it was such a relief to be able to breathe cooler, fresher air. And uh, the light was so bright, it really hurt. It was kind of like, whoa, you come out of a cave and it's, you know, but it was like sunlight. Uh, and uh, I really had to watch to keep from falling. That uh, ramp was very steep and he was, seemed to be in quite a hurry to get me going. I tried to look around and I know there was at least two other disc-shaped craft in there, but they were shinier and rounder than the one that we came out of. Um, he uh, rushed me across the, the floor there. This room was shaped like a, like a quarter of a cylinder, like one wall curved up to form the ceiling. Uh, so that was part of what gave the, the hangar, airplane hangar impression. Uh, but whether it was a, a building somewhere or part of a larger craft, uh, I was unable to tell. And the light coming from these panels was like sunlight, but um, it was like a translucent panel, so I wasn't able to look outside. Could have been a, an artificial light made to look like sunlight, or, or, or perhaps just a, some sort of uh, translucent window. But I was taken out of uh, that room, down a hallway, and uh, he left me in this room with some other people who were dressed like him, except uh, they weren't wearing the helmets. So uh, I was thinking, well, you know, now I, I can get some answers to my question. So I was still out of, out of control, you know, with, uh, to an embarrassing degree, you know, just basically screaming all these questions and begging and pleading about uh, what I just experienced but um, I was not getting any response. And they were trying to get me to go over and lay down on this table. And uh, since they weren't responding, I was immediately suspicious that this maybe wasn't a rescue, that maybe I was still in a, a very uh, bad situation. So uh, there was three of them, and uh, I was so weak. And they were so much stronger than me, they didn't, they didn't have a whole lot of trouble although I fought them, uh, get me onto the table. Um, one of them produced an oxygen mask looking thing uh, that they put over my face. And I, and I reached up to try to get it away. And just as I got my finger under the edge of it, uh, I blacked out. It, boom, I just went out. It didn't hurt or anything, but it was just like I just lost consciousness. Uh, if you've ever been under that kind of anesthesia where, you know, you just goes black. It was like that. And uh, 
So my next memory, and I, I'm not certain if it actually followed immediately in time or, because see, this conscious period occurred, you know, within the, uh, my experience aboard the craft, but I'm not certain whether it, it began uh, and ended right after I was taken aboard or somewhere in the middle or, or at the end. But my next memory was of waking up at, in the cold and I was on this hard surface my, and my head was on my arm, <laughs> face down, and uh, there was a light above me. So I looked to see where the light was coming from. But the light went off before uh, I, you know, had turned my eyes in that direction. And uh, all I could see was this shiny hull hovering there above the road, and just for an instant, and then it just went straight up without, without that noise that I'd heard before, uh, relatively silent. Um, it stirred the air a little bit, moved the grass along the side of the road and the, the branches along the tree that was there on the opposite side of the road. But it was just amazing to me how rapidly it was lost from sight. Probably partly because it was not lit, uh, contributed to the impression that it was just almost instantly boom, gone from sight without making a, a screaming through the air like a jet or a rifle shot or something. But uh, I was more concerned with where am I at this moment and what is my situation, uh, how dangerous is this? And I looked around and I recognized this stretch of road and I, I, I could see the lights down below, uh, down the hill, uh, and I recognized those as being a Hebrew the town nearest where this happened. So I was, I got to my feet and I was still pretty weak and unsteady, but you know, the feeling that, you know, here is my shot at freedom gave me the strength to run down into the town. And there was a building uh, with lights on and uh, smoke coming out of the chimney. And uh, it was nighttime, I had no idea what time it was, but I pounded on the door and nobody came. And uh, there's two bridges there in Hebrew, and this was across the, the, the first one. Uh, but I ran on down across the second one. There was a, a service station there. It's now been converted to a restaurant, but there was three telephone booths there. And uh, I went into the, to the first one, and it was out of order. Oh, man, you know, I, I, I didn't have any strength left. Uh, but I went into the next one and it worked. And you didn't have to even have a coin to get the operator in, in, in the, there at that time. And so I made a collect call to my brother-in-law and he thought it was some kind of prank call. Uh, I think he got the wrong number and he started to hang up on me. So I screamed at him and got him to realize it really was me. He said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait, just hang on, I'll, I'll get your brother and, and come and get you. I thought, my brother, you know, uh, he lives in Phoenix, and what's he doing here, you know? Because I didn't know. I didn't know how much time had gone by. Come to find out, the uh, operator, contrary to legal, <laughs> the law, had listened in on the phone call and uh, reported it to the sheriff. So, uh, it flies in the face of... Uh, the various theories these skeptics uh, had about where I was and what was going on. You know, that uh, this picture was taken recently, and those phone booths are still there, even though they've removed all the phone booths from everywhere on the mountain because they're just obsolete. But these uh, phone booths are still there because of what happened there. And, you know, it's quite a tourist destination. People stop and take pictures of it and like that, even though the phones no longer work. And, uh, Matter of fact, they're actually missing from uh, one or two of the things. But uh, after I after I hung up, I, I slumped down into the phone booth, and it just seemed like boom, they're here. You know, the lights of the truck were shining in there, and my brother come and got me out of there. And uh, it was then that uh, uh, some of the exchange made me realize, or made him realize, that I thought this was still the same night. He says, Travis, feel your face. And I felt a five-day growth of beard. And then I looked at my watch, 
And uh, the date had changed. So, you know, I was telling him, telling him what had happened and I just couldn't get it out. You know, I was just so hysterical. I was just basically, you know, sobbing and, and uh, crying. And, um, but uh, he was very protective of me. He, he passed away uh, uh, February before last. Uh, but, you know, he was very strong in trying to protect me. And uh, because I really needed it at that time, I was incapable of making any wise choices for myself. And uh, he'd been contacted uh, by various UFO investigators uh, during the uh, search. And he was out there every single day, you know, all day, every day, looking for me. And uh, they had. Uh, you know, told him, you know, just be careful who gets a hold of him, uh, should he ever be found. And uh, the family had uh, received some uh, rather ominous phone calls along the same line. Uh, there was a, a nurse who said that she had been working at a hospital where this old couple had come in after having uh, an encounter with some kind of a UFO thing. And uh, she said that uh, when she came back on shift the next uh, time that the records were gone, the couple was gone, and everybody was insisting this never happened. She so says, "She said, just be careful who gets a hold of me." And uh, there was also a phone call from a guy who said he was retired CIA, and uh, you know, it didn't sound wacky at all. He left his contact information, and he said, "Just be careful." So my brother did not respond with, "Well, let's just get him right over there to the sheriff." You know, that was not at the top of his list. His uh, main concern was my uh, health and welfare, and uh, you know, finding a doctor in, in that town would have been really hard um, because of the increase, the incredible, uh, you know, just uh, hysteria that was going through the community. Everybody was just so, it was just out of control. You know, Steve Pierce tells the story of. Uh, uh, them uh, reporters actually coming to his house and taking pictures of him sleeping through his bedroom window. And, and my mom, they stopped through her flower bed trying to take pictures through her living room window. And, uh, you know, there were reporters there from England and uh, Japan already, and it was just, it was just crazy. And plus all the crank calls that the family had been getting. And so it was very important to my brother that I get medical help. Well, uh, he had the contact information from this one uh, UFO group uh, who said, we've got medical doctors, we can handle this, you know, if he, if he ever shows up, we, you know, he, he needs to see us. So he contact, uh, uh, contacted them, we set up a, a meeting at this guy's office, went over there, and the guy was a total quack and uh, not a doctor at all, and it was quite obvious this, well, this was going nowhere. This guy, you know, hadn't even got a call from the guy who sent us there. Uh, and uh, then he tried to get on the phone and set up a, 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 an examination with a real doctor. So that just fell apart real fast and we just got the heck out of there and went back. And then uh, contacted by this uh, group here, this is uh, Jim Lorenzen, uh, who was the, one of the founders of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And uh, at the time they were the largest and oldest uh, UFO investigative group. And uh, they had some uh, real doctors in their Phoenix membership where my brother lived, and they set up a, a medical uh, exam. They, uh, these doctors actually came and made a house call, did the preliminary examination there, and then set up all these other medical tests. Meanwhile, the uh, wacky group uh, had announced, hey, we got the case, and then, oh, well, we don't have the case, so then they started attacking it because, uh, you know, they had to excuse why they no longer, you know, had the case. And so uh, they started claiming that um, it was a drug hallucination, that this, this wacky so-called doctor was a, a drug expert. And, uh, and so that they were uh, saying it was all hallucination. And, uh, but I had uh, uh, blood and urine samples put through the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen which showed no trace of any drug in my body. And uh, besides that, um, it's been uh, put on several of the, uh, uh, probably I think all of the polygraph tests that I took and passed, that there were no drugs involved. But 
You know, all these attempts to explain it away, one of them being the drug hallucination, another one that the, the, there was a theory that I had a transitory psychosis, that I, you know, become delusional, experience this thing, uh, and, and, uh, and then the third explanation was that the hypnotist had planted these memories in my mind. Well, what none of the press asked was, well, what about the other six crewmen? Were they hypnotized? You know, did they all have a transitory psychosis too? Do, do seven people have identical hallucinations? Of course not. You know, it's just totally ridiculous theory. Uh, but, um, you know, it was just a, a constant fight to try to um, um, counter all these accusations. And um, oh. uh, I want to tell you about Dr. Harder. Um, he, uh, he performed the hypnosis. He was a, a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, and he uh, did the hypnosis. And it was quite an achievement because up to that point, even though it had been a day or two since it happened, I was, I was still so distraught that I could only get out little bits of what had happened in response to direct questions, but I had not been able to relate it in completely because it was just so incredibly overwhelming. I just broke down. So. Um, he, he, he did a technique in which he separated the fear uh, from the recall of the in incidents and the events, and that was the first time that this room full of researchers had um, heard the entire story. But then, you know, it's important to note that uh, there was uh, two psychiatrists in the room. <laughs> So, you know, any theory that, uh, that there were being leading questions or in any way these uh, images were implanted in my mind is, a, is totally absurd because there was a whole uh, team of uh, people observing what was going on. It was all done uh, properly. Uh, as far as the transitory psychosis uh, thing was, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Leo Sprinkle, uh, he's a uh, the director of uh, counseling and testing at the University of Wyoming reviewed the psychiatric uh, test that I underwent and, uh, you know, characterized it as a totally normal pattern of scores, no sign of any psychosis. as kind of an uh, ad hoc sort of explanation. Uh, the astronomer uh, Jalen Hynek uh, interviewed me and uh, even though he had uh, been sort of involved with this other group that had initially been uh, contacted by my brother, you know, said that uh, I had been, uh, that I, he had sent the wrong man in on this one, because he was on the other end of the country, and that uh, I had been made the subject of a lot of unfounded and unnecessary accusation. But what I was left with were these nightmares, you know, it was, it was an ongoing, constant uh, state of terror for so long after that. And these nightmares of, of concerning uh, these, these eyes just staring into me in this way. And they were eyes that blinked, I had a pupil, an iris. Back in 1975, the term gray did not exist. Um, it may be that there are um, a lot of similar species that get lumped together. You know, they are a small, large-eyed, all uh, hairless, uh, pale creatures, and they just lump them all together and call those grays, uh, with the assumption they all come from one place. And I have a theory that that's not the case, that they're probably similar beings, perhaps from completely different star systems. So. And, uh, but uh, I've already explained my you know, theory about why, you know, these eyes were so, um, so uh, overwhelming in, uh, in their effect on me. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting little coincidences uh, in connection with this incident. This is a topographical map of the area. I got a whole uh, um, list of them. And I, was, I found that in a, in a book that had all the areas of the state of Arizona, you know, up to about 80 or whatever, 
but it was just coincidental that the area where it happened was Area 51. But a lot of strange coincidences, you know, like Robert Patrick, uh, who played the part of uh, the crew boss, uh, was actually born on the date that this happened, uh, November 5th. So his birthday corresponds with that. Uh, it also turned out that with a little research, he was actually double cousins with the man he was, whose part he was playing. Uh, on two sides of the family, that uh, they were cousins. And uh, all kinds of things popping up here and there uh, in regard to all of this. But one interesting thing that came to light uh, during the, the time that we were doing all those interviews, I told you about Alan Dallas theorizing that I was in a trance. When we went out to the site that winter to, to, uh, to uh, uh, do a film on the site, you know, sometimes uh, reporters are very insistent that we've got to be on the site. Well, there was three feet of snow out there and it was impossible to get there any other way. So they rented these giant snow cats like they use at the ski run and we went, you know, over the top of these snow drifts and, and got out there like nothing else on it could possibly do. And so we did the interview. I found out later that uh, uh, Mike, the crew boss, uh, had uh, figured out why it was so hard to find the exact spot. I thought it was because of the snow, the trees are all bent over, it's all covered with snow, we can't see the normal landmarks that we go by. And he'd gone back the next spring and checked out and found this, uh, that the trees nearest where the craft had come down had grown phenomenally faster than, than they should have. And so he took some core samples, and this is an example. Uh, and by counting the tree rings, you get one ring for every, uh, for every year. And uh, counting back to the time it happened, uh, we were doing the interview in 92, um, you can see that uh, even though this tree was 85 years old at the time of the incident, uh, in 15 years, it had doubled in diameter. So that was is more than uh, because it's you know each ring is bigger around. Uh, you can calculate that um, the trees were actually producing wood fiber at 36 times uh, the rate they had in all those previous years. Um, went back there this winter with uh, National Geographic. And uh, when uh, they proposed this trip there, uh, I, was, I was thrilled that this was an opportunity to do some follow-up. They were gonna bring some scientists and follow up on the, uh, the Geiger counter readings that had been made. Now, if you, if you have a copy of the movie, you might see on the end credits uh, uh, a credit for Geiger counter man. This was a scene that they filmed and didn't use. Uh, because they wanted to preserve the possibility in the minds of the, of the movie-going audience that maybe these guys had murdered me. So they cut that scene out altogether. Uh, because, you know, to have used it too soon would have uh, added too much weight to the idea that they hadn't killed me and that they'd seen what they'd seen. But uh, National Geographic has a reputation for doing some fantastic documentary work and hard science. So when they said, we're going to bring these scientists in, we're going to check the radiation and the magnetic readings and, and the tree growth, uh, they fell far, far short of that. It wound up just being a total goof. And uh, it was quite a disappointment. But one of the things that the skeptics had been saying was that the, perhaps this tree growth might uh, have just been due to uh, some good years, uh, extra rainfall or something. Well, the reason that it can't be that is because these were actually drought years with lower than normal rainfall, but the real clincher was the stump that I found uh, um, when National Geographic was there. Here was a stump in the middle of the clearing, and because uh, Arizona has such low rainfall. Uh, logging of, of a particular area is really pretty widely spaced. By the time you come back and do logging again, all the stumps and everything are rotted away. So this stump had to have been from the year previous to the UFO incident. We, we were there cleaning up after logging debris, and you know uh, there was a, a pile of logging slash. The log that I jumped down behind was was logging debris. 
And so this, this is a positively a benchmark for the growth rate of trees on that ridge top at that location. And here were, was a tree uh, 200 years old and the variation in the thickness of those growth rings is comparable to what you see prior to the winter of 75 when the incident happened. Uniform going back 200 years. So only, only after the incident did you see this kind of enormous jump in the size of the um, uh, growth rings. So that's something that I'm going to follow up on. Uh, Matt and I have been discussing the possibility of running some tests on the soil and some of the plant uh, uh, material that was, uh, and we've got to move quick because some of those trees were killed in a forest fire here a few about years back, and and uh, but they're still there, and the and the tree ring uh, evidence is is very strong uh, in a, a number of trees, and uh, with some other interesting things that I'll that I'll get to in a, in a follow up edition of the book, but I want to hurry because I've got a lot to cover here, and there's some other interesting things. Um, my uh, Number one detractor, uh, who you saw me challenging on uh, the uh, Larry King show, uh, has written parts of several books and a whole bunch of uh, these uh, reports that he'd send out to the media, uh, leveling all these accusations about the case. Well, um, after he passed away, uh, a Freedom of Information Act search was uh, granted and uh, I got a hold of the FBI file of this guy. And uh, uh, a lot of it was redacted. In the old days, they would uh, exclude this material with black boxes, but now they use white boxes. I guess that saves on ink. But um, um, they, there's uh, actually a memo, and I don't know if this is the one, uh, from J. Edgar Hoover to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Basically, to summarize a lot of the real pertinent sorts of things that were in this file, um, they're uh, saying uh, that uh, his, uh, um, a letter that class mailed to Bell Laboratories suggests the reading of the letter indicates writer is most likely not in full possession of his faculties. And so that was the FBI's opinion of this guy. Uh, uh, BU file, which is an abbreviation for uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation file, states that in view of classes in temperate criticisms and often irrational statements he made to support them, it was recommended that the Bureau be most circumspect in any future contacts with him. And uh, BU files uh, disclose that class has from time to time come to our attention by virtue of the fact that he has been in and then they redacted nine lines. This was a huge redact. And then a little brief thing where it says, this bureau, and this is the key phrase here, and not to be of assistance to his government. You see, the bottom uh, line here is SAC, the Strategic Air Command Dallas, is maintaining this case in RUC status. So basically what, what the FBI was doing was saying, well, we're not going to prosecute you for this. And what they had on him was revealing classified information. He was a reporter for Aviation Week and Space Technology magazine, and he had uh, revealed stuff that was classified, and, and they could nail him for that. So they said, well, we're not going to do that because then we'd have to bring this out in court, and, and that's secret, so we can't do that. But that's silly because they'd never be able to prosecute anybody for revealing secrets if, if uh, you know, taking them to court was would uh, reveal stuff. So what was really going on was this memo from J. Edgar Hoover to the director of the CIA, basically turning the matter over to them. They've got these uh, issues of uh, um, revealing classified information to hold over his head. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's not necessary. He was already rabidly anti-UFO. And granted, that's true. But this is typical CIA recruiting tactic. They get somebody that's already pointed in a certain direction, get some goods on them, threaten prosecution, and they're able to sort of direct their activities. And I believe, it's my opinion, that that's what happened, and this is the evidence of that. Uh, 
And there's some other things uh, that I could get into. Um, right before we went to the Larry King show where we confronted him, I was contacted by this guy that said that he had been there uh, when the incident happened. That he and his wife were deer hunting, and it was deer hunting season, and they had been on the next ridge. And he described the topography of that area. You'd have to be there to be able to describe what he described. It was never in any news report of any kind. Uh, he said that he had been uh, that he had been divorced from this woman that he was with, but yet she would still vouch that they had seen the glow of the craft, the, the flash of the beam, and all this from the next ridge. Uh, he said that when the men were accused of murdering me, that uh, he had uh, gone to his superior officers and asked if he could, you know, intervene to keep these guys from being prosecuted. And they said, well, unless the men are indicted to stay out of it. And when I say uh, superior officers, this guy said he was in military intelligence and he was just on leave during deer hunting season. So that didn't really ring any alarm bells at the time, but this military intelligence thing starts to add up and when you start thinking about this other stuff. What are, what are the odds that somebody from military intelligence is going to be there in this remote area standing there with a high-powered rifle. Well, I told uh, Tracy Tomei about this, and uh, he alerted Paramount Studios. And uh, they, unbeknownst to me, this all happened, uh, you know, I went on with Paramount's uh, publicity tour for the movie, uh, but they uh, flew him out to Hollywood, interviewed him. Uh, something made them suspicious. They at least wanted to confirm what he was saying. And so they enlisted the help of Cy Gilson, the state police polygraph examiner. And he tested this guy, gave him two tests. Now the first test involved, did he see what he said he saw? And was he in military intelligence? He passed. So that part of the story is true. They gave him another test, questioning him about his connection to these, this debunker skeptic group. And he flunked badly. And this is on the eve of my appearance across from this debunker. So that adds to my suspicion that this all ties in to this um, uh, effort to discredit the case. Um, further, uh, right after it happened, Steve Pierce, the youngest guy on the crew, was approached with a $10,000 bribe to deny the truth of the incident. And this, was, this offer came from Philip Klass, the guy that we're talking about here. Um, and the offer was carried by a local uh, law enforcement officer who's still alive and verifies that that is the case. Now, classes uh, defenders claim, oh no, that never happened. Well, I put that in my book back in 1977, and he never made any effort to go to this officer and say, hey, that never happened, did it, you know, or, and publish a quotation or anything. He made the $10,000 offer, and, and where is he going to get that? That's probably more money than he made on all the anti-UFO books he ever wrote. And uh, so where's he getting this money? Uh, some people claim they've seen canceled checks from these government agencies, but I, don't, I, I wouldn't uh, vouch for that until I see them myself. But um, I found out after Steve came back around here a couple of years ago, after being hiding out from this all these years and being willing to talk about it all of a sudden, he revealed that when he moved to Texas, Philip Class followed him down there, flew down there from Washington, D.C., took him out to dinner, and pushed and pushed on this idea of taking the $10,000 bribe. Well, uh, you know, if, if he was this astute researcher exposing some grand fraud, why does he need to have Steve lie about it? And uh, he actually published a quotation in his book in which he took out the middle part of a quotation from Mike to reverse the meaning of it. Totally dishonest. Um, uh, Mike basically said, oh, Steve's thinking about taking the bribe. Well, if he did that, and then he said, uh, even though you knew what really happened and you were doing it just for the money, class takes that part out and says, well, then you'll be bruised, you know. And so class is trying to imply that Mike was threatening to keep him from recanting, but the full quotation shows that he's threatening him uh, about lying even though he knows it really happened. So all kinds of real devious stuff there. 
Another thing, I criticized this debunker for being an armchair investigator, never doing anything but sitting there at his telephone and calling people up, recording the, the call, and then, and then taking everything out of context, chopping up the quotation to make it look like they said something they didn't. But he actually flew to Phoenix and had a guy that I met at a UFO conference there in Scottsdale drive him up to the site. And here, I've made all these criticisms and never once in any of those uh, uh, books or papers that he wrote about me did he ever mention doing any in-person investigation at all, even though I called him an armchair investigator. Now, it's very expensive to fly to Texas and take the steep dinner. It's expensive to fly to Phoenix and, and drive up there and spend all that time. But very curious that he would never, you know, brag about these things. If there was anything that he could use, you can bet he would have. Another very curious thing is that he did all of this stuff with never having contacted me directly at all. Never a single letter, although he poured them at Mike. Never any direct contact, even though he, you know, chased Steve around and, uh, to various locations that he moved to. And never once attempted to contact me, even on Larry King. They had him in another part of the studio. He never addressed me directly. I never addressed him directly. No contact whatsoever. The media was able to find me on the phone, and uh, I got plenty of things in the mail. But a very odd thing. And he's attacked a lot of people, and he very often would take direct quotations from them. So all that adds up to a very suspicious thing about um, uh, the source of all this uh, attacking come from this guy. Like I said, you know, he was rabidly anti-UFO to start with. But the reason I uh, bring this forward is not to, you know, that it's any significant thing towards uh, uh, the you know, credibility of my case, so much as to let people know that there is uh, an organized effort to suppress these kinds of things and uh, that it comes from higher government circles and uh, at least some covert agency. I uh, can't really identify that, but um, Mike tells me that he has been uh, badgered by uh, federal officers even in the last year uh, still. Uh, at one point, you know, years ago, they had a federal criminal investigator come to town and really started trying to hang him for some sort of contract uh, uh, problems, which didn't exist. And he wrote up a confession that he tried to force Mike to sign. And Mike said, I'm not signing that. That's not true. And so we left, but we found out um, what his real connection to all this was because we found out that he had gone to the sheriff and asked for a copy of that file. Uh, on the UFO investigation. And uh, he was claiming that Mike had, as a partner, a fictitious character, his brother. And Mike said, he's not a fictitious character. We're having a family reunion at the moment, and I'll take you and introduce you to him. And, uh, and actually did introduce him. So uh, it was just scare tactics. This guy was a very aggressive, very large man, very intimidating. And there's been a number of uh, things that have happened to Mike where they, you know, it's evident to him that they're following him around big time. But strangely, not me. No direct uh, harassment at all. So all that points to some very strange going on as far as that's concerned. And, and that's not over. You know, there's more, more to follow. We're looking into some things. Um, uh, let me see what else. Oh, I, I, you know what? I think I'll just open it up to questions. So, uh, anybody uh, think of something I might have overlooked? <laughs>